Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to my channel. I'm talking kind of low because I'm traveling at the moment and I'm in a hotel room trying not to wake my daughter in the next room. But I wanted to talk about these Hanna-Barbera DC crossovers because they're recent and I read all of them and enjoyed a lot and didn't enjoy some as well, so I wanted to talk about those. First, for those who don't know about these crossovers, this is the second wave that they've done. And there's actually been a series of Hanna-Barbera titles out under the DC banner. The Flintstones, uh, Scooby-Doo Apocalypse, they did a Wacky Races. The best one of all of those Hanna-Barbera runs is Future Quest. That has been amazing. By Jeff Parker and Evan Doc Shaner was the first artist there. Now they're doing Future Quest Presents, going more deeply into some of the characters that didn't get to shine much in that first initial arc. So that is a really great title. I highly recommend that. It's amazing. I'm not a big fan of the other Hanna-Barbera titles out there because of the way they approach the characters. So there's a number of ways you can do this. The Hanna-Barbera cartoons were, of course, for children. Children cartoons. So you can either make a children's comic book, like a younger children's comic book, but those pretty much already exist. There are already Scooby comic books and such. They wanted to make these for an audience that buys and collects superheroes and that would look back on these Hanna-Barbera characters with a little bit of nostalgia. The problem with a lot of those titles, though, was that they had to make these characters and their universes so much more serious. The Scooby-Doo Apocalypse, for example. Now they're all, of course, they've got their Jim Lee redesigns because he's such a great character designer. And now they're fighting some zombie apocalypse or something. I don't know. The Wacky Races is in a post-apocalyptic universe, and it's ridiculous. You can't recognize any of the characters. Wacky Races was such a fun cartoon, too. And that has become all this dark adult silliness. I've heard good things about the Flintstones, but it's not any kind of Flintstones you'd recognize from the cartoons. They're doing this sort of social commentary, I think, on societies and arranged marriages or whatever. I haven't read those titles. Like I said, some of the stories might be well told in them. I just I don't prefer that approach. I don't like that sort of deconstructing, remaking, darkening up, and, and updating quote-unquote classic characters, especially when it's not necessary, because Future Quest proved that. Jeff Parker and Evan Shaner, they just created this amazing universe. They took the Johnny Quest characters, Birdman, Galaxy Trio, even the Impossibles, and they wove Frankenstein Jr., and they wove all of these characters into a single universe, which fits because they're all pretty much in similar universes and they're in individual comic books as well. My tour was there as well. And they had a single threat and all came together to fight it. And it was, it was really special. It was really magical. It was an, an adult style threat. I mean, it wasn't kitty stories by any means. It was a real serious threat and you had good character development, but all the characters were true to who they were in those old cartoons that you loved. So they didn't have to update them or change them. Even the visual stylings, Doc Sheener's art there, they, they practically look like they came off the cartoon. Now they're a little more detailed and rendered more artistically. Doc Sheener's an amazing artist and he's not using some of the cheaper pictures and, and stock images that there were from cartoons, of course. He's updating that and drawing it with some good high quality, but, but he stayed true to the character design. So that was just brilliant to see. And I do recommend, recommend that title. The original Future Quest arcs are out in trade paperback. And then currently right now they're doing Future Quest Presents as an ongoing series. It's quite good. So that was the approach to the Hanna-Barbera titles. Now they did a first wave of crossovers with the DC heroes a while back. And there have been different approaches to the DC crossovers. The DC universe, of course, takes place in a bit more adult type universe. So some of the characters exist in a universe that doesn't quite hook up or sync up to the DCU. So there have been different approaches to this. One of them is to merge the universes, breach the universes somehow. So there was a crossover in which Booster Gold goes back to the Flintstone times. I didn't read that one again because I'm just not interested in that Flintstones reboot. But that sort of universe breaching, one of them I read that was brilliant was Adam Strange crossing over to the Future Quest universe. And that was a lot of fun. So Doctor Strange crash lands and Johnny Quest and his team go out and find him and everything. That was good stuff. Space Ghost teamed with Green Lantern, which was a wonderful story. So the universe breaching, that's one approach to take. Another approach is to take the character from the Hanna-Barbera cartoon and just set them in the DC universe as though they were always there. That usually involves roughing them up, though, making them darker, making them more serious. You have to make some changes to make them fit. 
usually that doesn't work. At least for me. I, if you make the character that unrecognizable, it just doesn't work. Another approach is to create your own little alternate universe in which both of these characters live in the same world because these crossover titles aren't necessarily subject to any continuity. Sometimes they fit into it quite nicely, but they don't have to. So this current run from the DC Hanna-Barbera crossover, we have four titles, and I have to say the main stories out of each of them are all well-written stories. I'm going to start with my favorite, which was the Super Sons crossover with Dynamut and uh, Blue Falcon. And this is a title that was looked forward to by a lot of us Super Sun fans because, of course, our wonderful title of Super Sons was canceled since Bendis is doing his own things there with the Superman family. And we're told that we're going to get more. I know they're, they've announced a limited series, I think, and hopefully they'll bring back the consistent run ongoing as soon as this Bendis story arc is over. But this is one final story we get to read here with Robin and Superboy teaming up. And I won't give away spoilers, but I will say the approach this takes is to take the Blue Falcon and Dynomutt and place them as though they've always been in the DC Universe. And I know I just said that usually doesn't work because you have to darken up the characters so much, but this is an exception. This really did that quite well. And the exposition is handled well in the story, too. It doesn't slow down the momentum. We have a, a clear threat, and Robin and Superboy are on their way to do something about it here. They've met Dynomutt. And the way they handle this is that Robin has already known Dynomutt. Blue Falcon and Dynomutt were part of Batman Inc. apparently now, in this comic book anyway. And Batman Inc. was a horrible idea. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that was a while back. The idea that Batman was sort of franchising out his vigilanteism, and so he was running the world basically by these partners in different parts of the country. It, it's a neat idea, and I'm sure some great writing was done here and there in that angle, but it just doesn't work for the character of Batman for me. And he did eventually abandon that, recognizing that that idea was a mistake. But the idea is that when he did that, Blue Falcon and Dino Mutt were part of his community there. And that's how he met Robin. And Blue Falcon is a wealthy billionaire like Bruce Wayne. Of course, Blue Falcon was a bit of a Batman knockoff a little bit, as a lot of characters were. And Dino Mud is his cybernetically enhanced family dog. And all of that carries over quite nicely. So Robin is able to just sort of give that exposition as to who Blue Falcon is, who Dino Mud is, in a quick, natural way as they're off to combat this threat so that it didn't slow down the pace of the story. The exposition worked, and it is a rare example of how it works to just move those characters into the DC universe as though they've always been there. That was really cool. This story was solid. I don't want to say too much more because I don't want to ruin it. I highly recommend you pick this up, even if you can't find copies anymore because they were pretty popular. A lot of comic shops are selling out of them, but it depends on your shop and how much they stock. You can always find it on Comixology, of course. Really done quite well, and I really hope that the way it ends, we could possibly see Dino Mutt more in the DC Universe. I would like that. This version of him is, is done really well, and I'd like to see that. So that is the Dino Mutt crossover with the Super Sons. Definitely recommend that. Peter Tomasi writing it. And gorgeous art by Fernando Pissarin and Eau Claire Albert. I don't know if I'm pronouncing those right. The names don't ring a bell. I'm sure I've seen their art before, but the art was, was gorgeous. I like that. The second title that was really quite good is the Flash Speed Buggy crossover. And this is the Wally West Flash. In terms of universes, this sort of takes place in the current DCU. You can, you can easily set it there. At the end, though, suddenly you have all of the Hanna-Barbera characters kind of present in the background. They're watching a race between Flash and Speed Buggy, so that would kind of take it out of the actual DC continuity, because there's... unless they decide to explain a way of that happening, because you had... Grape Ape and, and Jabberjaw and all of these characters sitting back in the stands with the Justice League and, and everyone, so that would have to be explained. But other than that little detail, this could easily take place in the DC Universe. It's an origin story of Speed Buggy that involves The Flash, and it's a well-done story. Scott Lobdell wrote the script, and we've got art by Mark Irwin on some pages, Norm Rapundo, Mark Deering, Matt Banning, a lot of artists and colorists on different pages. But the story is great. And it sets up what could be an ongoing title of Speed Buggy. In fact, I haven't looked it up to see if it's been announced yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if this was feeling people out for a possible Speed Buggy title. And if it is, 
I would buy it in a heartbeat. I would definitely sub to it because this is a great story. By the end, Speed Buggy's situation with all of his co-stars from the cartoon is set up and they're going out and he's a famous crime solver with his team there. So that was really interesting. I like the way they did that. We do have Wally West back with Linda Park at some point. And then at the end, I forgot to mention, we've got Bart Impulse is, is there as well. And he hasn't been reintroduced into the current DCU universe that I know of. I'm caught up on the Flash titles. I, I might have a Titans issue or two to read. So there are some things that would set this into sort of an alternate or maybe future time. But the Wally West Flash costume is the costume that he currently wears in the DCU. So I highly recommend that. That's another one that I would like to see more from, and that this wouldn't just be a one single issue, that it would keep going. Next, I want to talk about another great story, which is the Aquaman Jabberjaw. A lot of people are talking about this. This is a solid story, too. And this story takes the approach of having the two universes cross over. There's a portal. I won't give away spoilers, but there's a portal that somebody was trying to get through to go through time, but it ended up crossing over into a different reality, alternate universe instead. So that's how we have Jabberjaw, the talking shark, showing up in Amnesty Bay and, and Aquaman having to deal with it. The themes of this story are are well done. Jabberjaw is known for that Rodney Dangerfield, I get no respect kind of line, and that plays very naturally into this, and it even is repeated by Aquaman at one point when someone's joking about him talking to fish, as people tend to do. There's that low-hanging fruit by people who don't understand comic books or the characters. So so it, was, <clears throat> so it fit naturally well. It was very seamless seeing Jabberjaw swim through the ocean with Aquaman, and it didn't look childish or kiddie-ish, but it didn't betray the characters either, and that was good. And this was written by Dan Abnett with pencils by Paul Pelletier, and inks by Andrew Hennessy, and the art was quite good in there as well. Really good stuff, images and everything. Jabberjaw isn't the cartoony, kidsy version of Jabberjaw. He just looks like an actual shark, but he's able to stand upright. Talks just like he would from the cartoon as well, which is nice. The thing is, with this story, with this issue, and with the next one I'll talk about, they contain short little stories in the end. And the first run of crossovers did that as well. I don't think all of them had the short stories in the end. They might have. I don't remember at the moment. But the short story at the end of this one is a Captain Caveman story setting place in the modern universe. The premise here is that the Spectre and Shazam the Wizard are having a conversation and a disagreement about the nature of humanity and such. And to prove that heroism has always been in human culture, it's not something that evolved, the wizard Shazam pulls a Neanderthal into the future, into today's time, and he pulls Captain Caveman, as, as he ends up being, and he meets the teen angels that he has in the cartoon, Dee Dee, and I forgot the other one's name. They go around with him, he becomes a hero, they call him Captain Caveman. It's a really fun story. There's one moment in this story... And this is written by Jeff Parker. And like I said, Jeff Parker, I've just mentioned him as being the amazing writer of Future Quest who knows his stuff and knows how to do this, T to take properties that were seen as kiddie and make them quite interesting to an adult without betraying the core of the characters. He did that with Future Quest. He also did that with Batman 66. Those comic runs were quite good. And he does that here with Captain Caveman. There's one panel where he's fighting modern neo-Nazis. And he calls him Nazis, N-O-T-S-E-E-S, because of his language and everything, and Nazis. And that was a nice commentary on, on the Nazi ideology, this neo-Nazi ideology, anywhere, any way of being blind and being not able to see. So it was a little, little touch of modern politics, but it worked. It didn't betray the story. That was fine. So this is a, it was a fun story, Captain Caveman. I wouldn't mind seeing him more in the DC universe. I'm going to come back to Jeff Parker, though, in a moment. The last issue that we have in this crossover series, and a lot of people were talking about this being quite excited, was the Black Lightning Hong Kong Fooey crossover. This is written by Brian Hill with pencils by Dennis Cowan, inks by Bill Sinquix. And the art was good. It's not my favorite art style, but it's good. It's, it's a lot of lines, a lot of shading. They can look a little dirty on the page uh, in terms of just all the lines and the scratchings and stuff, just to my taste. But it's a valid art style. A lot of people like it, and that was fine. This is an example of the approach in which you create an entirely new universe to place these two characters in. So this takes place in the 70s, and we've got Black Lightning and Hong Kong Fui. And the cool thing about both of those characters when they were first created 
was they were playing into that little bit of exploitation that was going on in the 70s and such. And Luke Cage and Iron Fist, for example, came out of that sort of black exploitation and kung fu movie thing. And But they ended up being such great characters that they evolved past that and, and remain with us today as wonderful, fleshed out characters. Well, Black Lightning as well, he played into that idea when he was first created, but he's become a great character. Hong Kong Fui was very much a comedic take on that kung fu film genre and everything that was out there. The story is good. It's well written. It's a fun adventure to follow. The one negative thing I'll say about this, if you if you care about this, you might not care about it, but I don't really like the crossovers in which the Hanna-Barbera characters are completely unrecognizable. This Hong Kong Fui is nothing like the character you knew from the cartoons. This is an old, wise martial arts expert and very strong. He knows what's going on. He's very calm, cool, and collected, and so forth, and that's not our Hong Kong Fui that we do in love. Rosemary is here, but she's not a police officer, at least not that we know. She's a student at Hong Kong Fui's dojo. So if you don't mind the character being completely different from anything you ever knew him, it's a fun story. Now I'll talk about the problem. The big glaring problem of this entire crossover is Jeff Parker's other story now at the end of the Hong Kong Fui Black Lightning crossover. A quick little story. These are short because they're just sort of to fill pages at the end. And the premise is neat. He's telling a story of the Funky Phantom, who's a lesser-known Hanna-Barbera character, but a fun one in the cartoons. Jason Blood shows up. Jason Blood is bringing forth the spirit of this revolutionary soldier into the present so that he can talk to press and whatnot. And hey, guess what they're going to talk to him about? Gun rights. This story is trash. It's utter trash from a storytelling perspective. I don't care what your stance is on gun control. If you wanted a story, you're not going to get it here. All you're going to get is a lengthy political cartoon of propaganda about gun control. And again, that's not a comment on for or against gun control. It's a comment on how this isn't a story. There's no story arc whatsoever. They bring the ghost of the revolutionary soldier, the funky phantom, they bring him in. We've got the stereotypical characters of gun rights activists in the crowd, and they are all portrayed as rednecks who don't know how to handle guns properly, zealots and such. And then you've got some senators and, and reporters who are are a little more level-headed, and they're wanting the gun control, of course. And so the Funky Phantom reads the Constitution, basically, and he gets to the Bill of Rights, and he talks about the right to bear arms. And he asks about what kind of arms they have, and this guy pulls out an assault rifle, and he's blowing it up and showing how many bullets run out of it. And the man says, you need to understand, Muddy, people want to take our guns away. And the Phantom says, did I hear him say the nation has a standing army? And Navy, and Marines, and Air Force, the most powerful in the world... And the Phantom says, and you already have a regulated militia. And the people say, well, but no, we, we might need to stand against them. But you just said they were the strongest in the world. Well, the guns are for hunting. Is there anything left of the animal after such a gun? Well, they're for home invasions. Is that a big problem now? Look, it's all right. Your friend said so. That, that's dumb. That is, that, is a, that is a dream tweet from an SJW. That is just silly. This is not a story. This is a pathetic excuse for political grandstanding. And again, this has nothing to do with one's stand on gun control. It has to do with one's desire for a decent story. Now, granted, you didn't buy the issue for that story necessarily. You bought it for the Hong Kong Fui Black Lightning story. So whatever you get there in the end is just sort of extra. But Jeff Parker, you were so much better than this. This was just unacceptable. He just decided that he didn't want to write. He just wanted to preach. And he decided that he had you captive at the end of his comic book that you bought anyway, so he was just going to preach to you. And this was just, seriously, he could have just taken tweets off of Twitter and pulled this together. The whole idea of bringing a revolutionary soldier into the future, this is just sort of that dream that people have when they try and set up these scenarios to boost their sides of the issues and such. And it's really stupid. The portrayals of gun rights activists is, a, is insulting, and, I, and I'm not even a gun person. I don't own them, don't shoot them or anything, but even I can see this is very two-dimensional and it's it's bad writing, it's also bad thinking. This is intellectual laziness. This is setting up the argument in your terms, setting up your opposition in your terms, strawmanning the hell out of them, and then preaching and looking like the hero in your own little 
fantasy here. This is just an ugly, ugly little story, and Jeff Parker should be ashamed of himself, especially a man who's capable of so much better than this. He, he really is capable of writing amazing stuff. I'm a fan of so much that he does that it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing reading this story. No, I'm still a fan of them. This one story doesn't change that, but if, if I saw a lot more of this, it, no. I, I, would, I would think twice before picking up stuff with his name on it then, because that's a real problem. Hopefully that won't happen. Hopefully it's just a one bad decision he will turn away from in the future. But that's a quick review, spoiler-free review, of the DC Hanna-Barbera crossovers. I, I think definitely the Super Sons and The Flash very much worth picking up. And if Aquaman is a character that you're interested in or Jabberjaw, that's good. If you don't mind the fact that Hong Kong Fui is nothing like he is in the cartoon, then that's a good story. You picked it up and probably enjoyed as well. I would skip the Funky Phantom story at the end of that issue, but the Captain Caveman one was quite good. So there we have it. I'll be back tomorrow probably to talk about some more children's cartoon stuff, continue our discussion of animation from the 80s, the Thundercats and the He-Man and some of the great effects that they've had on us. I've had time to think about some new angles and some things that are that are important to talk about and bring to light, I think. So I'll come back with more of that. Until then, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the hero stories you love. Thanks for watching.